Well, good morning, good day, good evening, good night, wherever you're watching the video, I appreciate you dialing in for another one of our Sunday School series. Uh, we are now on to uh, session four, A Stairway, as we continue on through the book of Genesis. I appreciate you dialing in for another one of our series. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can hit us up over at the Facebook page at Web Baptist, or you can go to our website at webbaptist.com. Hit the like and uh, the subscribe to the channel. If you got any comments, you can leave them in the comments below, and we'll get back to you as early as convenience. Any prayer requests or concerns, send them our way. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so today we're continuing on. Last week we saw where Jacob uh, kind of deceived his father into getting the blessing that was to, supposedly to give to Esau. And we also see that Esau is the kind of person that was very careless with his birthright and really didn't care much for what was going on. I think he was more worried about getting the riches of the family and the household than he was carrying out God's plan. So we're moving on today and we're looking into a situation and looking into uh, God making contact with Jacob for the first time. Now, Genesis 28 begins with the account of Jacob's departure from the Pan Aram area, modern day Syria, and uh, the home of the country of Rebekah's relatives. So uh, Rebekah was sent her son you know, on the road uh, to get away from Esau. Esau was probably going to kill him. At least that was the fear. So, uh, you know, that was very important. Um, and, and so we look at this and Jacob received, you know, he kept, he traveled and we don't know. Any, we, we, he traveled for probably a couple of days uh, uh, and, and trying to get away and trying to, for the most part, looking for a wife uh, <laughs> to continue on things. And of course, back home, um, uh, Esau was still struggling with trying to, to please his dad and his mother and, and the situation going on there. So because Esau's Canaanite wives have been a source of uh, vexation for both Isaac and Rebecca. So um, so uh, plus Isaac met Rebecca's because of his father Abraham uh, and sent a, uh, sent a servant to Haran for the same purpose. So even though they sent uh, you know the servant out, to do the same thing that Abraham servant did for Isaac's to, to find Isaac, which was Rebecca, it's just not panning out. Um, things with Esau is just not what what was working out. So now, real quick, I'm jumping into Holman real quick because I want to make a uh, an obser observation first before we get started. So the lesson today shows a, 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 a confrontation with God initiated by God. Uh, one of three. So this is the uh, going to Holman. Uh, this is the first of three personal promises made to Jacob. First, in addition to promises for the remote future, God graciously grants intimate assurance to Jacob to sustain his faith. Second, God promises and preservation and protection. Third, God promises homecoming. God of Abraham and Isaac, and now God of Jacob is hardly limited to some geographical boundary like the deities of the surrounding communities, uh, the, the Canaanites. Uh, wherever Jacob would travel, God would be with him. Eventually, God will bring him back home. So look at the, he first promised that he would, uh, the promises for the remote future is what we're going to be looking at today. But, you know, he's also promising to uh, pre preserve him and protect him and promises to bring him home because I'm sure that he was, homesick in the midst of all this, as we will see. Um, I'm sure that he had some reservations of what he had to do against uh, his brother Esau uh, and what he did. He was a, a trickster. <laughs> he connived against him to get the first, uh, the birthright with a bowl of stew. I and mean, that's pretty much on Esau. Uh, and Jacob saw an opportunity, he took it. And then with the uh, conniving with his mother in regards to the blessing, um, you know, uh, uh, Jacob's looking after himself from a brother who really just didn't care. Uh, he had more so selfish motives than any than, than Jacob did. So anyway, so we're, we're picking up the story. He's on the road. He, he's he's le he's left home, and we start off in twenty eight uh, Genesis twenty eight ten through twelve. So Jacob left Beersheba 
and went towards Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with the top reaching to the sky, and God's angels were going up and down on it. All right. Interesting. Um, I don't think I would have used a, um, a stone as a pillow, but <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so uh, maybe if I if I were to ever had to flee home, I'd have to pick up a pillow. Uh, so, but this was very. Uh, we, we can't assume this is his first night on the road. Uh, it, it may have been. It may not. I'm, I'm pretty sure that a, a day or two may have passed before he got to this spot because this stop, this spot right here, would be very important uh, to, to both Abraham because Abraham uh, named it after he was dealing with uh, Abimelech. So, and then later on, we'll see where it's more of an important place, uh, a kind of a crossroads in the history of some of the events in the in the Old Testament. So. Now, um, the dreams, you know, it, there's, there's a certain, certain kind of dreams here that we got to look. The Bible scholars have identified three different dreams, one being uh, a simple message or a dream that did not need interpretation. It was just that. It was a message from God in a dream. Uh, a symbolic uh, dream uses symbols, but the symbolism were clear enough that no interpretation was needed. And then, of course, you got more complex dreams that needed uh that dream that required interpret an interpreter, and remember Daniel was was, was an interpreter of uh, dreams for the king. So uh, those are the three dreams that s scholars kind of talk about in regards to what we find in the Bible. And in, ca in all cases, you know, um, Jeremiah and Zechariah warned against the dreams and said we need to we need to question the content of those dreams. Uh, and the message in those dreams. As with anything, we should have a discerning heart uh, and discerning mind when it comes to uh, you know people telling us about the truth of God or revelations from God, as always. Now, we look at the stairway. The stairways, you know, some a lot of people have tried to interpret the, the what's called the Jacob's ladder uh, and the stairway. <sighs> I, I'm in this case. I'm taking it literally for what it is. <laughs> it, it's a staircase, uh, a stairways, and angels are going to and fro uh, from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. Okay, uh, there's nothing more that I read into it. Now, some Bible scholars will try to say that the platform from the ground to the sky it looks more like a ziggurat uh, of that area and that time, like the Tower of Babel. But you know, at the same time, the purpose of the is in stark contrast to the tower, in my opinion. Um, if ziggurats, for the most part, are one way, <laughs> you want to go up, uh, and you're trying to reach heaven. And uh, it, but this clearly says that this is top reaching the sky, and God's angels were moving up and down on it. Uh, so again, a lot of people have interpreted that as a just just stairs and some or winding stairs going down or a ladder or something. I, I don't know what, but I'm, I'm just going to take it as word. I don't think it was a ziggurat. Um, uh, so anyway, now about angels, I'm just going to throw this out there. Angels were created beings and they're not divine. They don't deserve our worship. We need to keep that in mind. They are primary function is to worship God and to serve God. When we see angels in scriptures, what are we seeing? We're seeing people who bring news, who bring destruction or bad news, and, and that's it. They don't come for worship, and they don't speak for uh, on behalf of themselves. They speak, and they're a mouthpiece for God, and that's it, okay? So don't let's not get, let's keep that in mind when we talk about angels. They're not worthy of our worship. Now, question, what significance would we place on dreams? What are some way God speaks to his people today? Interesting. How are some of the ways God talks to you and me? Does he talk to us in dreams? Possibly. Does he talk to us through other people, through messages from the pulpit, through uh, the reading of his word, through a neighbor? There are many different instances where you see where God is talking to us. Uh, dreams are one of those ways that he can get our attention. Okay. Now, moving on. Uh, Genesis 28, 13 15, the Lord was standing, now he's still dreaming, and he sees this in his dream. 
the Lord was standing there beside him, okay, saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. So he's saying, you know, of your grandfather and your father, the, the, yeah, those people, yeah, I'm their God. I will give you and your offspring the land of which you are lying. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south, and the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Wow. So, God has not forgotten his promise to Abraham. And this is it. This is why God's reaching out to Jacob. He's finding Jacob alone in the wilderness. Um, and he finds a moment where he can talk to him in your life. When, in, when you're out in the wilderness, so to speak, and that doesn't mean you have to go out into the bushes and the woods. The wilderness could be a lot of places, the wilderness of your heart, the wilderness of your circumstances. God was looking for that a long time so he can speak with you, just like he does with me, you, and everyone else. So here he's telling, he, he's introducing himself to Jacob for the first time. He's initiating that meeting, and he is reminding Jacob that this covenant that he made with Abraham, enforced with Isaac, and now enforced with him, is going to happen. <laughs> okay? And he's telling him, I am your God. I will give you and your offspring the land in which you're lying on. Uh, as far as east, south, west, north, I mean, it's it, we, we've heard this language before, and it blows us away when we first saw that promise given to Abraham, and God is reiterating what that promise is today with Jacob. So he was telling him, you know, I, and look at what he's saying, the most important thing to me. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. That's very important because at this time, in the Canaanite people and in, in the, the areas and the communities around the settlements, these people were very much a regional gods, fertility gods, nature gods, all that stuff. These people never looked beyond their boundaries, right? So here Jacob is, he's having to leave his home, leave his boundaries, leave his settlement, leave his household. And he's taking a chance. He's out in the wilderness, right? And he's traveling through the land. You know, he's got a purpose. But God is saying, wherever you go, I'm there. I'm not going to be just here on this hillside uh, in a dream. Uh, I'm, going, my, I'm, I'm everywhere. You know, this is the kind of God that we need, is it not? Uh, if God was only for the people uh, in that area of the world, then he would do me no good. But no, he is telling Jacob and he is telling you and me today, I am with you wherever you go. Very important for us. And look, he says, I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised. God is sincere and very committed to fulfilling the promise he made to Abraham. That's very important for us to look at. So, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing here. Now, you have to assume up until this point in time that Esau and Jacob heard a lot about God through their father Isaac. But, you know, that's like they were just sitting in worship and going through the rituals but, and, and hearing the word but they never had any experience with God up until this point, okay? So Jacob has this experience for the first time, and his reaction is pretty awesome. So just get some information here. The Lord had first identified the boundaries of the land promised to Abraham and his descendants. These geographical boundaries have only been realized twice, and that was in the reign of David and Solomon, and later during the intertestimonial period in between the Old and the New Testament. This land was variously called Canaan and, and Israel. It became known as Judah and, uh, in the southern tribes and Israel, Samaria in the northern tribes after the split between uh, after Solomon's reign. 
During the Babylonian exile, the separation from the land was a key part of Judah's punishment, while return to the land would indicate re return to God's favor. In the New Testament times, the territory primarily consisted of areas known as Galilee, Samaria, and Judah. So we see that, you know, God you know, at one point took that gift away from them and then brought them back. And, and, and from at the end of the Old Testament, we see where punishment is, and judgment is being dished out. And, uh, of course, that they come back because that sets the stage for the ultimate return of God's glory through Jesus Christ uh, in the New Testament. Thank God for that. So God's most immediate promise for Jacob involved the, his presence. And that's very important. Jacob would go forward knowing that God would protect and provide for him. God's presence is still vital for believers. His presence provided comfort during difficult times and correction as we acknowledge and nothing that nothing escapes his notice. So that's very important. The power of God is accomplished his purpose is evident in creation where God spoke and it was so. And his ability to penetrate over the innermost thoughts and intentions. Uh, wow, that's just some of the key concepts I'm reading here. Again, our God is an active God. He is active not just during this time in history, but all points in history. He is active with me, and He is active with you. That's the kind of God I want to serve. That's the kind of God that deserves my worship, okay? That's the kind of God that deserves my heart, who's got my best interest for, for me, and who is active and walks alongside me and tells me, just like he told Jacob, I will not leave you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, that stands out to me more than anything. So moving on, we look at Genesis uh, 28, 16, uh, 7. Oh, well, let me see. We got... Me the, let me go, jump back. We got Kittner to get to. Uh, I, th I thought I was missing Kittner. I just want to say something real quick on Kittner. Um, uh, looking at what we just read for this promise given. So this is the supreme display of divine grace, unsought and unstinted. Unsought for Jacob was no pilgrim or returning prodigal. So, I mean, there was nothing Jacob was doing to uh to initiate this uh he was just uh you know a, a conniving little you know pain in everybody's backside uh and he was escaping what he just did as far as stealing the birthright and now he's looking for uh a wife it wasn't like he was showing any kind of remorse or concern of what he did yet god came to meet him angelic retinue and all Taking, uh, taking him wholly by surprise, unstinted, for there was no word of reproach or demand, only a stream of assurances flowing from the central I am the Lord to spread from the past to the distant future, from the spot where Jacob lay to the four corners of the earth and from his person to all mankind. It was almost immediate apostate, meaning his solidarity, homeless and precarious condition by assuring of his covenant with his forebears, allotted him a landed inheritance and promised him safe conduct. Wow. So Kittner kind of hits the nail on the head. Jacob didn't earn or call upon. He didn't earn anything that God just said. This was all God initiated by God. Same thing with uh, Abraham. Uh, he came with him the same way. And God was determined to meet that promise and that covenant fulfill that covenant, and he was not going to give up on that despite who Jacob was. Now, let's see how uh, Jacob responds to this. Okay, we jump to 28, 16, 17. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, that it, What an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So he was like, awesome. He was blown away, for lack of a better word. If we could take some of the language of today and plug it into the Bible, blown away would be, uh, would be on there, right? So uh, awesome. Uh, you know, sometimes we just, we just don't, sometimes we don't have the words to, to describe the, the blessings we receive sometimes, is it not? And so what we have here is he woke up, and surely he's saying, surely this, uh, and he's saying, I did not know 
This is the place of the Lord. Now, did the place dictate uh, God's terms? Of course it did not. I think the place is kind of irrelevant. It would become an important place because of things like this would happen, but God could have talked to him at any given time. Uh, he could have talked to him when he was still sleeping under Isaac's uh, roof, but he didn't. He could have slept. With, he could have told him when he slept a day later down the road. I, I mean, I, the place did not matter. What mattered was God reached out to him and, and talked to him. And and Jacob didn't ask for this, but he was blessed be, because of that. So, uh, very important. Uh, you know, obviously, when we look at his experience, you know, he he was. Afraid, rightly so. I mean, you're talking about the the Lord God. This this is this the the God that your father and your grand you heard you, you heard stories from about your grandfather and your your father talked about. And uh, you know it, what what is that like? Whenever the, the 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 beliefs that you grew up with are suddenly standing right before you, because he never had a religious experience up until this dream. Rightly so, he is scared. I think he was afraid for a lot of reasons. Now, looking at the reason he's afraid, well, you know, a lot of times when we look at why are we afraid when we're confronted by God, a lot of it's got to do with the fact that we feel sinful because of our sins, rightly so. Jacob probably looked at his life and said, I'm less than stellar. I don't deserve this blessing. I don't deserve what you're saying to me. Right? So that's a very strong possibility. Uh, in the light of this holiness, this God coming to him, this powerful supernatural being standing beside him in the dream, I'm sure he looked at himself and said, Man, I do not measure up to this at all. I'm a conniving, deceitful young man, and here you are promising me all this stuff. And look at what he's saying. Man, this is an awesome place. What an awesome place this is. Uh, so he, he was uh, blown away. <laughs> That's the only other word I can say. So uh, because of God's presence, Jacob recognized the space where he slept both holy and the patriarch changed the name of the place to Bethel, which means house of God. Years la uh, later, after parting with uh, Laban, Jacob sanctified himself and his family um, with a return to Bethel. On, his, uh, on this occasion, he built an altar or according to the Lord's direction. So this would, would become a spot that uh, would be very important uh, just, just for, for, for Jacob. Uh, you know, sometimes we have those landmarks in our lives too that the certain spots become very important to us. So we look at this and we're like, man, you know, the, the promise of, of a future is given, the promise of today was given, and uh, the promises going forward. Um, God was going to promise to be with him, bless with him, and not forsake him wherever he goes. And that was very important. So question, in what ways might sensing God's presence change a person's perspective? Well, I guarantee you whenever I'm sensing God's perspective, I pause. You know, because I, I, I kind of I want to see what, what am I doing? What, what correction? What direction does God need? Because obviously if he's, kind of in control and he's pushing me along or he's directing me along. I want to get it right. I want to follow his lead because he knows best for me. Uh, there are times I do understand myself. I know my flaws. I know my weaknesses. I know my strengths. But at the same time, God knows me intimately far better than I'll ever know myself. So when I sense God's presence or direction, I pause and make sure. I want to listen. I want to follow I'm not one of these people that say, Jesus, take the will. I'm one of these people that say, Jesus, you had the will the whole time. That's what I want to do. And Jesus, let me remove my hands from the will while you're driving. God is not my co-pilot. He is my pilot. And I got to trust that pilot with what I do. That's what I try to live by. That's not to say that I'm always doing it, but that's what I try to live by. And I hope that you live by that as well. So moving on. So now we look at the vow, Genesis 28, 18, 22. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set up as a marker. And it may not have been a pillow. It may have been just a marker or something. I don't know why the stone was there, why it was important. Who knows? Maybe he didn't have a body pillow and he needed something like that. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. 
Uh, but to be honest with you, I don't think I could have went back to sleep after that. He was, I would have been up rejoicing, dancing, singing for the rest of the rest of the night. Who knows? He poured oil on top of it. So he's talking about the, the, the stone he set up as a mark. He poured oil on top of it. He named the place Bethel, though previously the city was named Luz. When Jacob made a vow, if God will be with me and watch over me during the journey I'm making, if he provides me with food and eat, to eat and clothing to wear, if I return safely to my family, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a marker will be in God's house, and it will give you, and I will give you a tenth of all that you've given me, or you give me. All right, man. There's a lot to, to unpack here. So he's he's remembering what God says, so, and he's basically saying, uh, again, this is his first religious experience, his first meeting God beyond the stories that were told to him by his father. Okay. And so with this, he's saying, okay, God, if you're going to do all this that you've promised me, if you do all this, then yes, you will be my God. That's essentially what he's saying here. God, if you're going to be with me through thick and thin, you're going to take care of me, and you're going to see your promise fulfilled through me, then I'm yours. Okay? <laughs> so that's what he's saying here. You do this, and this marker is a testament to that. And here I promise I will give you a tenth of everything that you give me. Wow. Now, now we go back to tenth and we automatically think tithing, we think money. Uh, and that we, we've kind of addressed that before. And when we look at tithing, it's very important. What do we tithe to God? And it doesn't have to be money. It can be your time. It can be your gifts. It can be a lot of things. It could be your time with your neighbors. It could be witnessing. It could be your time at church. Again, the time that we spent worshiping God. Is it even a tenth or is it more than a tenth? Okay, uh, it's very important. And that goes back to what I said in the video, uh, you know, the series before. Okay, when we looked at uh, some of that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, and we got to understand that these these portions and these, these the scriptures that are put in there are not necessarily put in at a later date. If we believe, and Noah wrote this through the holy direction of, of the Holy Spirit and through God, then this is something that uh, is very important. It was codified in the Mosaic Laws in regards to what we give in our tithes and offerings, right? So we start seeing that early on what's going on here. And it wasn't necessarily brought at another time. Okay, so looking at this, um, we look at that Bethel. Okay, Jacob spent night at Luz, but uh, he woke up the next morning and returned, to, and he named it Bethel. So he laid his head down. He was in Luz, L-U-Z, and now when he woke up. He was he he renamed it Bethel. So Bethel played an important. Uh, role in the history of God's people. Jacob's grandmother, uh, grandfather, excuse me, grandfather, uh, Abraham, had built an altar in the area, and Jacob would return to the spot after returning to Canaan with his, Canaan with his family. Later, during the era of judges, both Deborah and Samuel administered civil and religious affairs at the region. Earlier in the divided kingdoms, King Jeroboam set up golden calves at Bethel and Dan in the effort to keep his subjects from going to Jerusalem to worship. Bethel was destroyed uh, in the 6th century when God's people fell to the Babylonians. So it served its purpose, uh, but people made more of it than they should have. So um, that's pretty much what they're saying here. That's the history of Bethel in a nutshell. <laughs> so, uh, But again, we go back to the tithing thing. You know, we go all the way back to the uh, Melchizedek, where he, th this this king of Salem, priest king of Salem, um, you know, was was feeding and, and, and taking care of Abraham and his men as they returned from the battle with uh, King Chedorlaomer, and Abraham promised to give a tenth and gives a tenth to to uh, Melchizedek. So, um, and, and, the, and a lot of scholars try to say that well, that was plugged in later, so the priest would have control over the populace. Well. 
if they did that later, then they would also say that Jake, this was plugged in for Jacob as well. Uh, so you, you start seeing where the holes and the arguments are taken, uh, taken apart because if you take it for one thing, you have to take it from something else. So if you think Melchizedek was added later, uh, later on in Scripture, well, this here would also be added on later on as well. Uh, and there's no indication showing that that had been the case. So now when we look at, you know, I'm going to ask you a question. What is the, what's a marker for you? You know, there's a lot of things that we look back in our Christian lives and we ask ourselves, where, where are the markers in your life? And what I mean by that is where was God, you know, where has God moved you at a point that you said, this is, God is a real person. God is real. Not only during the point of where you were saved, that is a very important marker. Um, there's sometimes it's places, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's things in our lives these markers are, are things to remind us of God's glory and God's grace and God's love. Uh, so ask yourself, where are those markers in your life? So wrapping up, we'll summarize. Believers can, can see God's work, uh, see God working in the ordinary. Amen. Believers can find peace in knowing that God is faithful to, to, his, to his promises. Amen. Without those promises, where would we be? Believers can experience the joy of God's presence. Amen. We need that every day. Believers can live in assurances of God's faithfulness. Wow. Amen. We can amen to all of that because that's what we see in our God, is it not? That's what we believe. We have an act of God. And I keep saying that because it's true. God is active. He didn't stop just at the cross. The message of Jesus Christ needs to continue. That only continues between you and me, with you and me, moving forward for your neighbor, for your co-worker, your people, your nation, your, your community, your city, your town. That's very important. God is still moving. God is still active. So keep that all that in mind, okay, when we move forward. Keep all that in mind tomorrow when you go to work, when you go out and you see your neighbors. Remember them. God is an active God, and He is with you, and He will not leave you, okay? Thank you for watching. I appreciate your time. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below in the comment with the video. I appreciate that very much. Like and subscribe to the video and the channel. That way you'll get updated every time a channel is posted. We try to do a, a post of some of these on uh, Mondays for the topics, and then on Thursdays we do the Sunday School series. Of course, our, uh, our messages for Sundays will be posted soon after we wrap up the services on Sunday. We invite you to tune into those because our pastor's got some very good messages that you really need to listen to, and they're very good. Um, and as always, we appreciate you coming in. We invite you to come down to Web Baptist and be a part of us. Be down here for worship with us on Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday service, or Wednesday night where we have service and then we have Bible study. You're more than welcome to come down here. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. If you can't make it to Web Baptist, Please find you a Bible-based church wherever you're at. Get plugged in. And I guarantee you, you're going to be a blessing to that church family. And that church family will be a blessing to you. I promise you that. God is active. Okay? Until next time, take care and God bless.